If anything, Sandro, uh, just remind that uh, everybody who stays in the Zoom agrees um, to be recorded. If you don't agree, uh, please uh, leave uh, the Zoom uh, channel and um, go to the YouTube uh, link. Um, uh, so I can officially open the seminar, uh, if you all agree, and it's a big pleasure, already anticipated with a pre-seminar laugh <laughs> and, uh, and friendly chat with our friend Nandita. Um, Nandita Matthew is, uh, is a researcher from the uh, Unomerit in Maastricht. Um, she's a rising star, I may say, of the industrial dynamics um, and organization field of research. Uh, she's, uh, she's interested in uh, the microeconomics of innovation. She works also at the intersection with development. Uh, in fact, today I think she will present something about uh, India as well. I think she's, she had the, uh, the, the nice and pretty unique occasion to work with, uh, uh, say, funders of our uh, fields, uh, like Giovanni Dosi, but also with uh, superstars uh, like Alex Code. And so you can tell that um, uh, in order to work with these people, you need to be, you need to be a fantastic researcher, and she is. Um, Today she is presenting a, a combination uh, of, uh, of of papers and uh, ongoing uh, ongoing work. Um, the title of the seminar is "What a Firm Produce Matters: Processes of Diversification and Self Discovery Among Indian Manufacturing Firms." Um, but she's also uh, she's also telling us something about, uh, as I said, ongoing research. You can find their works on. Uh, on top field uh, journals like research policy. And uh, as always, uh, it's a bit redundant to say and to mention the list of publication, uh, just go on Google Scholar. It's more efficient than Albert. Uh, so Nandita, the, the floor is yours. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, you've got max one hour for the, for, the, for the speech. And then we're gonna have like one hour max discussion. And, um, if there's any uh, non-GSSI uh, fellow, um, this is the first uh, seminar after the Easter break. Um, do um, have a look on the fantastic lineup of speakers that are following uh, Nandita. So Nandita, you are, you are kicking off the, I think the, the, this term uh, uh, in, in a very, in a very snappy, nice way. And we look forward to hear from you um, about your research. The floor is yours, thanks. Thanks, Alberto. Thank you very much for your uh, very kind words. <laughs> uh, I'm very happy to, to present uh, GSSI. I hope next time uh, I can come in person so I can also meet you people and also meet the PhD students and uh, other faculty there. Uh, so I'll share my screen now so you can... Okay. Do you still see my shared screen? No. Uh, now we only see at the desktop. Uh, no, I, I understand. Yes. Okay. No, I, I, um, it's just that it's a bit weird that I speak on looking at the other screen, so I want to do. <laughs> okay. Now we don't. See, we we see you, not the screen. I... Now you see, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So today um, I will speak um, about uh, the diversification process of firms and very much connected to development. As Alberto was saying, I, I work uh, mostly on industrial organization, but also how the dynamics uh, at the micro level shape the macro performances of, of countries. Um, Indeed, uh, to begin with, uh, I would cite this paper by Hausmann and Roderick, uh, where they uh, talked about economic development as a process of self-discovery, that countries uh, self-discover 
or uh, find out what they are good at producing. So, uh, but if we think about it, it's not countries, but the real actors behind the production are firms. And that's why in this talk, I will talk about farm level process of diversification. I love two parts. The first part um, is a published work. Um, and the second part is an ongoing work. Uh, the first part will deal with uh, firm level process of diversification in the sense that what happens uh, when firms diversify into products that are new to the firm. And then we will move to the second part where we will talk about how this firm level diversification, which are on focusing on the events that are contributing to country level diversification, like which are products new to the country. So um, uh, when, I, when I was invited uh, for the talk, I told I will present the combination of these two work, which I believe that goes together. So one is published and you can actually find it online. And as Alberto pointed before, yeah, uh, I, I worked with uh, Giovanni Dosi, who was my supervisor for the PhD. So this is a, a joint work with him and uh, Manuela Pugliese, who is working at the European Commission at the Joint Research Center. Uh, it's it's online. Uh, so this work, what we do here is to understand the firm level processes of diversification in the sense, um, what are the incentives for firms to diversify, to bring in new products, to, uh, to uh, is it better for them to diversify to related products or unrelated products? And how does it affect the incentive structure of firms? This is the question that we will ask here. So there were three main motivations behind uh, this work, and it's also related a bit to the second part of the uh, discussion as well. Uh, the first one is on the economics of development, then the strategic management and theory of the firm. So the economics of development, starting back from uh, Schumpeter, um, economic development is about indeed qualitative change. So change uh, a process of, let's say, structural transformation where there's a change in the composition of the products produced or exported. So it's not about uh, doing more of what you're doing, but it's about change as well. So there are there is this process of creative destruction where some sectors will be destructed, some sectors will be created, new jobs will be created. At the macro level, um, there has been a lot of works, uh, especially uh, at the if you look at the economic complexity literature, they look at the export basket of products telling uh, about the complexity of the product basket, telling um, which uh, try to uh, predict the country growth paths. So in a way, telling where um, one could also infer it as one, um, uh, uh, this literature could give indications on where a country should uh, invest next, let's say. So in this process of, let's say, self-discovery, countries start uh, entering into new sectors. But indeed, it's firms that, let's say, produce new products. And of course, there have been works before uh, in the economic complexity literature that have talked about the process of accumulate, um, capability accumulation and uh, how the process of capability accumulation, diversification, and growth is the core of the micro dynamics, macro dynamics of development. Because um, when we talk about capability accumulation, um, it's also uh, important to remember that, especially for developing countries, uh, it's likely that these are the big firms that have already, let's say, patiently accumulated the capabilities that can enter into new uh, sectors or new products. And indeed, in our case, uh, this uh, we will discuss in the second part in detail, that out of the 128 new products, when I say new products, these are new products to the market, new products to India, between 1990 and 2015, only nine were introduced by new entrants. The rest were firms that were already uh, producing uh, some or the other products. So they were building their capabilities to enter into a new sector, let's say. Um, the work is of interest indeed also for the strategic management crowd. Why? Because here uh, in this specific uh, work, we are talking about whether diversification improve firm performance. It's also important to understand the incentive structure of firms because um, uh, indeed, there are social returns, but are there also private returns? 
So should a firm diversify in a related or unrelated products if uh, we think in line with the capability accumulation that we are talking about, likely firms are doing this new activity that is related to what they have been doing before. So um, it's also uh, nice from a strategic uh, management perspective to understand uh, if related products, uh, adding related products to the current product basket uh, will lead to, let's say, higher performances. And then again, in a way, we are also testing the theory of the firm. So starting from Penrose and T's, they talked about the capability-based uh, approach. So the idea is that the firm has intangible capabilities that it possess, and it has uh, capabilities that can be put to use for a new uh, activity or new uh, production. And so uh, the firms enter into firms diversify and grow. As uh, those we pointed out in 1988, what a firm can hope to do in future is very much constrained by what it has been able to do in the past, which means, uh, again, it goes back to the argument on the capability accumulation, uh, and especially that's especially rele relevant for developing countries. And a lot of works have focused on how much firms grow instead of looking at the processes behind how uh, firms, uh, firms grow. Uh, to add here the difference uh, or the main point that we want to make here. So Penrose, for instance, pointed out that um, the firm can have some extra resources and it wants to put it to use and so it start making uh, some products. So the firm has this set of uh, capabilities which goes to different products. But of course, uh, what T's later pointed out was that this extra resources cannot be physical resources because if it were physical resources, one could trade in the market. These capabilities or these resources are intangible capabilities that are very product specific. So the firm has a set of, let's say, intangible capabilities, which helps it to make specific products. And later in the paper, we will show that uh, these capabilities are indeed very much product specific. So we'll come back to this picture later when we discuss about the uh, capability structure. On the first uh, part, we will try to understand what is the relationship between the scope of the firm and its performances. Thus firms um, uh, have incentive, let's say, to diversify, to, to go into a new uh, production line. So we can measure firm performance. I mean, we do it with uh, in two different ways. We look at both firm growth, sales growth, and uh, profitability. So in line with the theory, one could uh, try to guess what would be, let's say, the predictions. What, what about scope and performance? Indeed, it could be that the diversification grants more sources of growth because you are diversifying in a new market. There is no reason to think that you're taking away anything from any other market. So likely you will grow more. But however, um, in line with the theory, we could also think that this kind of happens in uh, when there is a low growth potential. So, um, so it's a tricky econometric problem uh, to deal with. In terms of uh, profitability, one could uh, uh, assume that, look, they are moving away from their key capabilities because always the product that you're producing is always more related to itself. So whatever you're doing is slightly less related. So maybe uh, there could be lower profitability, but on the other side, maybe there are economies of scope. So maybe there could be higher profitability. So um, this is with respect to scope. What about with the coherence? What if the, there's a coherent diversification? There is no, uh, a reason to uh, think there is no, let's say, no prediction between uh, coherence and the firm growth, but profitability, indeed, one can expect that there are higher economies of scope huh, for a coherent uh, product basket, so like, let's say, high profitability. So these both these studies that I will present here, we use uh, the Indian, uh, it's based on the Indian manufacturing uh, database that we have. Um, so this is uh, the database uh, called as a province. It is provided by the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. Uh, this is the only database at the firm level that is a uh, panel. So you can track firms in time. And this is also the largest database that is available. Um, the company is covered account for 70% of total industrial output, 75% of corporate taxes, and 95% of 
excise taxes collected by the government of India. And then we also have product level information uh, that is available for 90% of manufacturing firm, which account for more than 90% 90 of uh, total manufacturing and export. So uh, just to give you an idea how this looks like. So this is the, the NIC is the national industry classification. The PIC is the product classification. It's a local product classification, which is very similar to the harmonized uh, system at six. And there is also an eight digit. Uh, so the, this is just an example for how this would look like the basic metals. And um, for each of the product, we have detailed information on quantity, price, uh, uh, and the total sales. If you look at just the summary statistics on looking at how are the firms, how are single versus multi-product firms, you obviously immediately see that they are very different. The single product uh, firms are smaller. Uh, the, um, uh, the, also, the growth is higher for multi-product firms. Um, they do more R&D. Given these differences, what we look, we start by looking at uh, the performances and the firm scope. So um, we have a set of control variables, and then we start by looking at uh, OLS and a fixed effect to understand uh, what is the dummy, the effect of the dummy of being a single or a multi-product firm have on performances, both at firm growth and profits. Uh, I, I, I don't discuss the control variables, but if you look at the red uh, um, uh, row uh, the, at the bottom, you see that the single or the multi-product status of the firm, the results are quite confounding. So the OLS and fixed effects gives opposite results. And um, one also have to think this in line with what uh, we saw before that the single and the multi-product firms appear different just with the summary statistics. So we check this in more detail to check if uh, 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 how different are the single and the multi-product firms. So we run a linear probability model and also a probit model. And what we see is that indeed they are quite different and the variables that were uh, uh, they are different are also the same variables that are kind of uh, significant here. This means that there is, a, there is a classic selection problem that these two firms are very different. Um, and in such a case, we need to let your control for this selection aspect. So the uh, one standard way to do this is uh, by looking at the Heckman's treatment effect. So you have a set of equations. The first uh, one um, control, um, first one is the, um, the dummy that takes value one if the firm is a, a multi-product firm and zero if it's a single product and you uh, look at probit or, or linear probability model and after controlling for the selection, you look at the performances. But however, the effect of being single or multi-product uh, status on firm growth is um, the coefficient that you get is for a random firm. So in the sense, it, the, this includes both uh, the effect of both single and multi uh, product firms. So for instance, already a Heckman's treatment effect gives better results in the sense that you see that there is 14% increase uh, in growth uh, just um, after controlling for the selection. But however, um, what we want or what we would uh, guess by looking at the fact that already these two set of firms are different is that maybe these uh, also the effect of uh, being single or multi-product firms or effect of diversification could be different for the firms that actually diversified and, and for the ones that did not. So we want to separate this coefficient uh, to um, understand uh, to, 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 we split the coefficient to two. Basically, you will have the treatment effect of the treated and the treatment effect of the untreated. In this way, we can actually, after controlling for the selection, we have two coefficients, which will say what would have been the effect of the multi-product uh, firms, um, what would have happened if they stayed single. And this is what we see with the second column. What we see is that, the multi-product firms would have lost around 22% of growth if they stayed single. And the single product firms would not have got anything. It is 0 0.051 
if they move to, uh, if they diversified. And uh, the similar results for profitability that the multi-product firms, they would have lost around 17% growth if they stayed single and the single product firms, actually they would have lost around 14% growth if they moved to a multi, uh, if they diversified to a multi-product, which is huge. So this, uh, in a way, um, once we properly account for the selection issue, we indeed find that diversification uh, is positive or is, is positive related to firm performances, both for firm growth and uh, for profits. Um, and these are also some, these, the results are in line with what we would expect with the capability-based theory. The next question what we want to ask is that, um, which, in which products firms diversify and how it affects performances, like the sense of the coherent diversification. To go back to the discussion, what I uh, was mentioning in the beginning, uh, the paper of Hosman and Roderick, what they say is that it's important to understand or to learn what one is good at producing. So we also saw that the most of the new products are produced by incumbent firms, the firms that are already existing in the market. So. Uh, it is very relevant to understand when firms enter in this new activity, how related it is to the previous activity. So why this work uh, or why this part is interesting is to, uh, when you say that when countries should invest in a new sector, we, it's important to understand if the firms, the, if there are firms that are producing a related product or not, because otherwise maybe the countries cannot really uh, start uh, uh, this production line. And of course, if they have the incentive to diversify, this is what we will look here. So does coherent diversification lead to higher performance? For this, indeed, first of all, we need a measure of product relatedness, which are the products that are related. So there are classic measures of relatedness like the taxonomies or uh, the hierarchical classification. So like the taxonomies like the private taxonomy or the hierarchical classification like the harmonized six digit or even the national classification. But however, these, none of these classifications were made by the statistical office to understand capabilities of firms. So there is no reason to believe that this really talks about product relatedness. Going back uh, to the picture that I showed uh, before. So what we know from our data is that we have firm and we know that the firm produce some products. What we want to infer or what we infer from this is that, okay, this firm has a set of capabilities that allow it to produce these three products. Of course, we don't see these capabilities. We just see that the firm produced these three products. With a lot of data, we see that, for instance, the first firm produced the first two products, the second firm produced all the three products, and the last firm produced only the last two products. So there is no firm that produces only the first and the third product. And so we infer that these two products are not related. So basically it, the idea is uh, it's a database approach, very similar uh, to what is done at the macro level, at the country level, like by Hidalgo. And it, it is very much in line also with T. So in the end, we can compute the relatedness among all the different couple of products in the database. And we can also come up with the coherence of the total uh, product basket by weighting uh, with the quantity of the products produced by firms. So in the end, we, we can have a value between zero and one that will tell us how related a product is. So here in this picture, we, um, the, in the right side, you see that it, uh, the values go between zero and one. One is, which means that it's fully related. Zero means it's not related. So these are the colors. And um, in the row and column, I have ordered the products according to the uh, hierarchical classification. So according to the national product classification. So the diagonal line, means that the product is related to itself. If the, uh, uh, if the hierarchical classifications were a perfect measure of relatedness, we would have seen a block diagonal matrix. This is not the case, but however, we see that there are more colors that are centered to the diagonal uh, line, which means that the measure is not random. But however, we are losing a lot of information, all these relatedness we lose 
if we use uh, hierarchical threshold simplification, and we are also taking up a lot of signal that we shouldn't be taking. This um, picture is done at a four digit level. It's just for visual uh, clarity, but in the end, what we use is much more details, uh, six digit, uh, we use at a six digit level. And now I'll also show you uh, the network structure, um, how it is. So for instance, um, here, the different colors are different sectors. So you see the dark color is minerals, and then you have uh, textiles, leather, and you, we put a node um, to the product that is most related to the product from where we are putting the node. So for instance, we see 13 is metal products. These two products are very related to each other, 1302 and 1304. And again, this uh, network picture is also at a, a more disaggregated level. This is at four digit because six digit is, you can't really visualize. So uh, even though, so here it might seem trivial, but it's not so trivial. So for instance, if you look at the bottom right uh, column, you see um, uh, that this is a paper sector, which is nine. And the product that is related to this six or four, if you go further in detail, those are jute bags that are more related to paper than to textiles. So firms that are making uh, paper products uh, make jute bags and not uh, much more than the firms that are doing uh, textiles. So this is the kind of information that we have. And then with this, we look at uh, if coherent diversification brings or is related to higher performance of the firms, and indeed it is. Um, and this is the evidence that we find. This is with a uh, simple OLS and the fixed effect regression. We also do this for different sectors and the results are similar. So uh, to, uh, to sum up this part, um, I would say that the, um, in, the results we find are in line with the theory of the firm in the sense uh, it's compatible with diversification as a strategic choice to, let's say, best utilize the product specific capabilities. We also observe that the capabilities are product specific. So uh, indeed the capabilities, capabilities, if you have excess capabilities, you cannot really sell it to another firm because they are very much embedded within the organization or the uh, uh, routines that you have within the within the firm. Uh, also for the strategic management uh, literature, it's interesting uh, in the sense you know that diversification brings in increased uh, firm performance and coherent diversification as well as related to increased uh, firm performance. And also it's very important uh, from the development uh, perspective. Um, so while the macro works can tell uh, where, um, uh, let's say it can tell which seed to plant or which sector a country should engage in, uh, our work can also say which is the firm that can help uh, with this, which is the firm, which are the firms that have the capabilities to, to start this. So let's say, um, the World Bank, for instance, want to fund green housing in India. With our measure, we can we can tell them which are the firms that are doing related products that will help for the construction of a greenhouse. This is a kind of uh, policy that we try to bring in. But um, um, and indeed also which firms have incentive to diversify at that moment. But however, the uh, here we looked at products that are new to the firm. It could be a very different scenario when. Uh, the products that are new to the country, because there is a huge risk in um, in producing a product that is new to the country. This is the second part, and this is uh, the work that is uh, not uh, yet published. So the um, all the firm, all the uh, all firm level diversification is doesn't uh, is not part of country level diversification, but all the new products to the country are in some way new products to some firms. Um, to mention uh, just a minor point that uh, we said before, out of the 128 new products that were introduced in India, I will explain a few how we identify this, only nine were done by new entrants. So uh, there is a risk that is associated with this new activity, but of course we know that 
the, the private returns could be few, but the social returns in entering such new activities are huge. So it's important to understand if there are private returns and what are the private returns, because if there is no private return, then maybe one has to support these firms who uh, to enter these new activities. This is the argument behind. This is a work and um, that's co-authored uh, with Alex uh, Code at the Vaseda Business School. Um, uh, it talks about early birds and early worms as a title, uh, first movers and followers in the introduction of new to market products. So we look at the first mover advantage. Thus, first movers or innovators have an advantage over the imitators. This is a very relevant question to the policy also that we just discussed. To uh, give a short idea on how much uh, different are the uh, um, the works uh, in the sense, uh, if a first mover has an advantage, these are two papers that have been published in Harvard Business Review in 2014, the same year. One paper said that the first mover has an advantage, while the other paper said that the second mover has an advantage. So it's uh, uh, both were published in a matter of, I don't know, a few months, a gap of a few months. <laughs> um, so the the first paper means being early beats uh, being better. It's by Grieve and uh, Sidel. Um, so they compare the sales history of two aircraft, so two wide body jets. One is the McDonnell DC-10, uh, which was the first mover, and the Lockheed L-1011, which was a follower. The DC-10 had design flaws. So like the cargo door, one separated from the aircraft mid-flight. I, I think it's a pretty serious problem if the cargo door uh, separates from the, from the aircraft. But still, DC-10 had about twice the sales as uh, the L-1011. So an inferior product kind of bet the superior one. The argument that they put in is that, okay, the first mover indeed have time to establish customer relationship and a, let's say a chain reaction of events to stay ahead because of course the second one is always lagging in terms of building all this market. Uh, the other paper that says uh, in the same journal, in the same year that says the second mover has an advantage uh, points out to uh, two products that are like classic Betamax versus the flat screen displays. Indeed, the followers came up with a better technology and they were also, let's say, able to play catch up and become leaders in the LCD uh, space. So the advantages of the second mover um, uh, uh, that they point out is that uh, indeed the second mover can observe how the market reacts to the first mover and also kind of play catch up forces. Uh, they, they can jump in when the learning curve is already uh, better and try to take advantages of the lessons and the mistakes from, uh, from the first mover. So our contribution here, uh, we look at uh, if the first movers have an advantage over the followers. We look at the product performance in the sense when we say first mover, it's a first mover in a specific uh, product. Uh, so we look at how the product uh, perform in terms of both uh, product life and the number of years uh, from uh, producer and uh, the product sales. Um, so there are um, some peculiarities of the data that is the same data that I said before, but um, uh, an additional information is that we also have uh, the commercial name of the product, which is very different from the harmonized system six digit or eight digits. So we also have the commercial name of the products that the, the firms produce. And here we are talking about products that are new to the country and not new to the world. Um, and this is, um, this is important to note. I wouldn't call this as a limitation because it's exactly what we want to study in a developing country because products new to the world are covered by patents, but products new to the country, especially in a developing country, much of the innovation is about imitating products that are done in the developed country uh, to bring in uh, similar uh, products that are of a low cost. So I wouldn't put this as a limitation, but this is what we identify here. We don't see the products that are new to the world, but new to the country. So how do we identify the first mover? 
we go back and look at uh, the changes in the classification by the status it's doing. So when there is a new product that is uh, produced by a firm, the, the ministry uh, adds this in the product classification at the eight digit level. So this is uh, one way to check. Uh, what we do is we also give a bit of time lag because sometimes it takes one or two years after the introduction of the product that this um, product gets included in the classification. But more um, in addition, we also do a Google search for articles after the first uh, two steps with the, since we know the firm name and we also know the commercial product uh, name, we can look for a Google search, which will help in identifying uh, articles. There are also specific websites um, for investments and um, where we can look at uh, the new uh, products that are launched in India. So for instance, you can, uh, you can confirm that uh, in the third step with such Google articles that these are indeed new products that have been new to, the, to India. For instance, BHL, uh, Bharat Heavy Electronics Limited is a public sector firm that have been uh, 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 since uh, 2003 or so, they are building capital goods just to help um, uh, let's say local domestic production of capital goods for the firms because India have been importing, have been relied a lot on imports of capital goods. So this is one of the public sector firms that have been, let's say starting uh, uh, bringing a lot of new products. And, it, and there are also uh, many products that are still done only by this, uh, this firm. So this is the kind of information that uh, we collect and then we identify the different categories. So we look at, the first movers are the firms that introduce a specific product for the first time. And then we have followers, uh, which are the firms that have started this new product in the coming years. Then we separate them to fast followers or slow followers. So fast followers are the ones that act within one year uh, from the introduction of the new product and the rest are the slow followers. We also did uh, the results below. We also did some kind of robustness check with uh, fast followers being not just the first, but also the second year and the overall the results doesn't change. So first we look at the characteristics of first movers. Are these first movers very different from the followers? So what we see is that there is a significant difference between first movers and slow followers. The first uh, movers spend more on R&D, they um, do more marketing, they are more diversified. However, there are very few differences between the first movers and fast followers. I mean, fast followers have similar R&D investment. Um, there are very high ratios, more than even the first movers on selling, distribution, marketing. Um, it kind of gives an idea that the first fo fast followers are equally ready to bring in this new product. Uh, it's a, it could be just a strategic choice or it could be, um, um, it could be even random, but they, they are ready and they are prepared to start. Uh, and it's evidently that if they came in the next year, they were indeed ready to, uh, to bring in this new product. Uh, this is just uh, the results that I talk now. So what we uh, look, as I mentioned before, um, is we look at product performance in, uh, in two different respects. We look at the product life and also uh, the product sales. So for the product life, we run uh, both OLS and Cox regression with the number of years on the left-hand side with the set of control variables. We have the product specific, sector specific, time specific dummy. And then we have, um, we have the dummy that takes value zero if the firm is a first mover. And then it takes value, uh, there are different dummies. It takes value one if it's a fast follower and another dummy, it takes value one if it's a slow follower. What we see is that the first movers have longer product lives than slow followers. So uh, they have an advantage over slow followers, but fast followers have slightly higher expected uh, product uh, longevity than first movers. The products that stay uh, for longer are the ones with higher sales as expected with from firms that are smaller and older. So this is the table. So the, uh, the ones in red are uh, the results that I just discussed. 
uh, it's interesting to see that uh, the first movers does not have any advantage over fast followers, which is the first uh, column. Uh, if at all, if there is anything, it's the opposite. Um, however, the fast followers do have some advantage over slow followers, which is the, the last uh, column. And then we look at the product sales. Uh, before getting uh, to the regression, we uh, look at, let's say, some distributional plots to see how um, it looks. This is uh, the year of entry. So uh, it's not a calendar year, but it's the year of entry of uh, uh, first movers, fast followers, or slow followers in a specific uh, product. So you see that. Uh, the right uh, the, the right distribution is the fast followers and it is shifted to the right. Uh, the red distribution is also the fast followers, which is shifted to the right, which means that they have a higher product sales than uh, the first movers. And this plot, we show the log average uh, product sales. Um, this is again uh, on the x-axis, we have the different year of introduction, which is not basically calendar year, but uh, the first year, second year, third year. And also here you see that the fast followers are much better off than the first uh, movers. This is again, let's say reinstated uh, also in our regression analysis. We find that uh, the fast followers have higher, we check both sales and also sales growth. Um, and there is no significant difference between first movers and followers. So here, this is a table where, um, with the regression where on the left-hand side, we have the product sales, and on the right-hand side, we have a set of control variables and we have a dummy. Uh, so the dummy for the first column uh, takes value zero, if it's a um, first mover, and if it take, uh, takes value one, if the follower is uh, on the second year of the product introduction, and the same until the seventh year. So you see that the fast followers, the first and the second column, uh, they have significantly better uh, product sales um, than the first movers. To, um, to sum up the uh, what we saw in the second part is that the first movers and fast followers have very similar characteristics in the sense that they both seem to be, uh, let's say, ready to, uh, to, to uh, introduce this new activity. And uh, the first movers do not have any advantage with respect to the fast followers. So the question is beyond patent protection, uh, does policy need to boost the incentive to first movers, uh, because as uh, I mentioned also before, the country diversification or countries moving to new activities means firms should move to new activities. If firms should not move to new activities, should we incentivize them uh, if there are no private returns at all, uh, given that the social returns to such new activities can be huge. Uh, indeed, Hosman and Roderick uh, calls for govern government intervention uh, to protect the initial uh, players in the market, like in some way to discriminate the innovators and early imitators. Mm, so this is the broad discussion that uh, uh, they do. And here, indeed, we provide some strong empirical evidence uh, that supports what, uh, what uh, they have been uh, saying. So yeah, I mean, thank you. That's it, and I will. Uh, uh, we can use the uh, time for uh, the comments. Uh, let me. Thank you, Anandita. Thank yeah. you very much. I give a round of applause. I'm the only one with the with the mic on. So um, thanks for the thanks for the nice uh, nice presentation. Um, I I will leave the floor. Uh, two questions from the young um, colleagues, PhD students in particular. Um, any questions, comments from PhD students? You've got the priority. Can I go on, Alberto? Yes, Francesco, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, uh, thank you, Nandila, for this interesting contribution. I have uh, some, some comments, um, mainly refer in part one, when uh, you have showed uh, a sort of network that explain a relatedness of product. 
and uh, I think could be useful uh, making some uh, analysis on that network. I don't know if you are reasoning about it. For instance, uh, the code 701, 706, and word 702 related to leather products presents a clique in jargon. So they are really, really close. They, uh, these products are closer than others. And uh, in uh, the entire network present a lot of components, not really connected between, uh, between them, but uh, could be useful uh, to use uh, a measure of centrality, for instance, between a centrality could be useful for detecting characteristics of the product which mediate. I think, I don't know if you are reasoning about it, uh, because it's uh, it's reasonable to think that uh, even in the second part, uh, for what concerns first mover, imitator, and so on and so forth, it's reasonable to think that positioning may affect results in terms of, of innovation. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, um, can I, shall I answer now or? Um... Yeah, you can, yeah. As, you, as you wish, uh, but I think you can go with the reply yeah. if you want. Yeah. Th thanks, Francesco. Uh, it's a very good comment. Indeed, actually, I'm not, uh, I didn't uh, uh, get further down that line on looking at the different network and it, it's in, it will be interesting, I think. Um, so um, just to uh, give you just a quick comment on how I would relate this to the second part, it's, uh, uh, it's not very easy. Uh, to look at the relations simply because we we do a data driven approach in the first part. So we look at which are the firms that are already producing. So based on the Indian data, uh, these new activities in the second are always unrelated. So we'll have to rely on an external measure. You, you see what I mean? We'll have to take uh, an external measure of relatedness and then see how related firms are to, because the new activity, if it's not done by any firms, by definition, it will be unrelated because we look at co-occurrences, right? So one way to do that would be to, um, let's say, take some kind of a micro level measure that is done for other developing country, I would say, just to stay close. And then to look at, uh, then to look at, uh, if it's related or not, uh, to how related, then we can have a number on how related is a new activity to what uh, the firm has been doing before, yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any, any further questions? Uh, again, PhD students, you've got the priority. Okay, I have one. Who's, who's Andrea. here? Andrea, Andrea, yes, go ahead, yes, please. Well, uh, Nandita, thank you for the presentation. It was really interesting. I want to <laughs> read the <laughs> the contribution. Uh, I was thinking if the, the data informed you that the firms are producer, of that, because for example, some case there are that firm that produce and sell other products. This is one, the first question. And then the, the um, According to the literature about diversification, it's really important what you distinguish that is the product is new to the team or new to the region. You emphasize that you are only using data new for uh, inside India, but if you have the regional distribution of the of the firms and the products, it would be really interesting to to have a look also to to take into account the knowledge spillover. Maybe could be nice. And the other uh, question that I was thinking was, uh, if you have data about the age of the company, this is only to know if the, the more diversified are new firms or maybe firms that have experience, uh, knowledge, uh, I was thinking and those things. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for the questions and the comments. Uh, so uh, on the on the first part, actually, we do have um, information both on the production and uh, the selling. But what we understood that it's mostly of an accounting thing in the sense sometimes funds produce and then they don't sell that year; they sell the next year. So there is no, there is not much of a. a difference between these two uh, but uh, yeah it's something uh, maybe uh, that one could check what 
would be interesting would be to check if um, the products are sold in the same condition, no? Because then this would be this would be different. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I wonder if, uh, while this could be the case, um, if you're not diversifying, I wonder if the firms do this just to enter a new market, you know, to enter a new market, to buy an input and sell would be a bit too, um, I don't think this happens, but it's something that uh, one can check. The regional distribution, indeed, um, uh, we have, um, uh, we have detailed information on the even at the pin code, but it's not where the plants are located, it's where the firms are registered. Um, so it might be useful, but um, I also don't know how much is the spread, how uh, we have not actually looked at this angle. The age of the company, indeed, we control for the age of the company, uh, but uh, it's nice, it will be a nice exercise to look at how uh, the dynamics with the age. So for instance, as I pointed out, one thing that we uh, we looked and we saw is that uh, the new uh, products are mostly done by incumbent firms. They are not entrants. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there, are, there are very few, more than 90% were done by firms that were already uh, in there. So uh, this we know, but uh, we maybe there are more dynamics with respect to the age of the, of the firm. Cool. I'm still uh, um, giving priority to uh, the PhD community. Uh, if there's any uh, question from, from PhD students, uh, please come forward. Yes, I've got Adriana maybe, but uh, stay with me a second. I just want to give the last chance to PhD students uh, PhD students one, PhD students two, PhD student three. Okay, uh, Diana, go ahead. Uh, hi, Nandita. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoy it, and I like a lot when we have uh, empirical studies on countries where there is not uh, so many in which literature on it, and then. India is a big potency now, so it's, it was very joyful. I was asking, I, I never use Hidalgo related product. I use uh, related variety, classical, <laughs> Frank. Uh, there is a paper of hard talk where, which I kind of apply in Italy too, where they show that, for example, for Finland, this related, Okay, this relatedness is a stronger in high tech manufacturing, for example. So uh, firms that are high, which means that more knowledge is spillover or more product, perhaps more product relations among firms can be strong if there are if their knowledge base is higher, for example. I don't know on related product if you can see exactly this. In the case of Italy, we found that it's not high tech, but it's more, uh, uh, we use public taxonomy. So we saw that it's more a relationship between those ones that are manufacturers, so those ones that produce a lot of uh, uh, manufacturings, and the other ones that are not high tech, but uh, are like medium. So there is a, a correlation among these two types of industries. I'm going to give you an example. For example, uh, the manufacturing of Fiat's, Okay, so they buy the big industry machine, which mean, mean, means they need uh, like medium level of innovation, but they work together. They are correlated because the uh, big industry call the other one and say, okay, I need this, this, this. So they generate this uh, technology for them. So there is a relatedness among uh, two level of uh, technology. I don't know if this is possible. I, I think it, it could be possible. You could apply maybe a taxonomy by SIG OECD and see if this relentless is strong in those uh, industries that are strong in technologies. I don't know. Just yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, so um, you, you talked about uh, technologies. So here, actually, we, we look at a product, something similar can be done also, like uh, by looking at technologies and patterns, just to 
let me uh, share uh, my screen. Do, do you have the Natch code? Yeah, yeah okay. for sure. Okay, that one. You, you could use that one to allocate the industries. Yeah, so uh, one of the points that we, we were mentioning uh, was that uh, uh, maybe the industry classification might not uh, 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 might not be so disaggregated enough to understand the capability structure that we want to say because what we are saying okay. is it's very product specific and um, to answer to your previous one of the comments uh, on the different private sectors we tried as well and it's interesting because maybe uh, this would be different for a country like Italy uh, what we see is that mostly it's a scale intensive sector like for India that uh, okay. the coherence is uh, very much uh, related and the science based it's it's not so much i mean it is significant but okay not so much so it's kind of different from what you were saying in the italian case so yes the quality was different yes so okay you really find that there are more high-tech industries that are currently related among them no the so no, no what we okay what we see here is that for uh, scale intensive sectors ah, okay uh, the relationship between um uh, the coherence and the form okay of stronger okay this is this is what uh, we, we see but okay. um, now it's um, uh, to 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 look at uh, indeed here actually we don't look at different the relation relatedness between different sectors per se because we have all the products in all the sectors so we have we give we feed in all that information inside and then we see, so it is possible that uh, there's a product that are that is in high tech, so it's related to uh, something in textiles. We don't know. Uh, this this is we we give this possibility, so we don't make a predefined classification based on the sectors. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You you see what I mean? So we 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 totally leave it to the data. So it's a data driven uh, measure where we feed in all the products that we have and. Uh, we look at which are it's possible that firms that have that are using chemicals are also in textiles it happens uh, it's also possible that firms that are in the chemical sector and in the food sector uh, so yeah okay okay thank you thank you um, any any further question um, from the faculty um, now it's your turn Anybody? Okay, I can I can go with the uh, with uh, with some questions and data in the meantime. Um, thanks for the. Th I mean, first of all, thanks for the for the contribution, which I think that it's interesting for us. You know that uh, the GSSI there is a, a strong taste for regional um, investigations, and I think that although you don't really you know you don't really touch upon uh, anything which is strongly geographically related, the implication for uh, these kind of studies are quite big from, from your approach and, and, uh, and methodologies. And, and I'm, I'm also a little bit uh, uh, now intrigued by, by, by your data. You said that you've got uh, the commercial name of uh, the product, which is um, very nice and a very nice um, you know, source of information. So. I'll, I'll definitely have a look. By the way, you published the paper on the day of my birthday, so I'm sure it's it's a it's a super good one. Um, I saw the date on the on the on the on the, on the research policy page. Um, I think that my question pretty much relates to what Andrea was uh, was saying about the regional uh, the regional distribution. I'm I I want to enlarge it and extend it a little bit, and I'm going to uh, speak about space. Um, so uh, I think that space, uh, either global space or local space, uh, moderate uh, the process that you are investigating quite a lot. And especially it moderates the nature of the first, uh, the first followers, uh, which by the way, I think it's a, it's a nice addition to the literature. Um, because you know, I, you say at the end of the day, there's not much of a difference. Uh, if you are a first mover of or a, or a first follower, there's there's not such a big and huge difference. And uh, but because basically the first followers were people that were just as ready as the first movers, but they just you know maybe on the day of the of the launch they just woke up uh, five minutes later. And but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, 
from a market technological point of view, they were as ready as. Uh, nevertheless, uh, to me, one thing is being a fast follower. Uh, in the case you've got a first mover on the corner of your uh, street, you know, or for instance, if you are part of an industrial group or uh, you are a subsidiary of a multinational corporation. Uh, so on the one end, we were talking yesterday about uh, the local buzz and the global pipelines with, with some colleagues. And I think that, for instance, in this, in this particular case, they, they could both matter. Um, so to me, no, it's not just an it's not just an addition. It's 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 a, it's a thing that I think would explain a little bit better what happens really there in in the absence of difference. Because at the end of the day, uh, being ready if your neighbor is the first mover is completely different than being ready if you are uh, I don't know thousands of kilometers away and if you don't know each other and so on and so forth. The guy that was uh, thousands of kilometers away and, and was as ready as the first mover is 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 a is basically a first mover um, herself or himself. Um, whereas the guy who was just close to the first mover is is a good imitator or a good friend potentially, you know. Uh, same thing for the multinational corporation. How do they enter your 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 analysis? I think this could be um, relevant. No, yeah, uh, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, continue. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and then uh, as, as I'm, I just want to conclude, uh, um, potentially, I, I didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I got. I'm, I'm going back to the first part of the of the of the of the work. Um, I'm not sure I got it right, uh, but in case I got it right, I saw that. Um, Essentially, if you are not diversified, you better stay not diversified to some extent, uh, which is like a little bit counterintuitive uh, for those who claim for policies that I know that this is not regional, uh, it's, not, it's not a regional analysis, but basically, if you translate your results into a regional setting, you're saying, well, regional diversification is basically uh, counterproductive. So I, <laughs> I was wondering whether you can tell us something about that. If you yeah. have some thoughts about yeah. so um, um, I, I will I will start from the first uh, point. Uh, you are uh, absolutely right. I mean, maybe we could look at also the regional or local capabilities. I mean, we are talking about uh, the scenario within India and uh, these uh, 128 products. I, we don't know how much we will have when we if we start to split it in uh, different regions. Uh, I think it is interesting also. Uh, in line uh, with other papers now that have talked about like poaching of employees from the pioneers uh, and uh, how the first more fast followers could come up. So this in this line, indeed, it could be interesting. It's something that uh, we will take a look at. Um, and on the second uh, point on the diversification on policies, and I think it is uh, pretty relevant. Um, the I don't know if it is exactly counterintuitive. So the idea is that the firms um, has to follow different pathways, right? So the firms have even in line with, let's say the Sirera Maloney innovation paradox, capability escalator kind of literature, firms are in different ladders. So maybe firms don't have the capabilities to benefit from diversification at the point. So yes, the policy should not ask all firms to diversify. This is the point. <laughs> In the same way, policies should not ask all firms to start doing an R&D <laughs> because maybe they don't have the capabilities that are in place to start doing R&D. This is a... Um, uh, so... Uh, I think the policy should be to build the missing complementary assets or the building blocks around so that firms can slowly move from one step uh, to the other. So um, uh, in, in a way, the results that we find says that firms are not totally stupid in the sense they know uh, what they're doing, but of course, it's a very minimum level of rationality we are talking about. We are not saying that they are fully rational or anything, but still uh, in the sense they are trying to able to identify themselves and say that, okay, look, we maybe we can start entering the production of this because now that we are producing trucks, maybe we can start making cars. So, um, and I don't think um, 
uh, so yeah, the policy should be carefully, uh, uh, let's say, formulated uh, uh, in line uh, with what what we say. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Um, let's see whether there is any any question from from the floor. I, can I, Alberto? I can try my hand. I don't know for which reason, but uh, can I? I didn't see you, Sandra, but go ahead, please. No, you didn't see me because they couldn't. I don't know why. I've tried to raise my hand, but I couldn't. You know that then my Zoom is really maybe trouble, but uh, I'm sorry for that. Can I? What is, yeah, yeah. Right, so Nandita, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, this is really, really interesting. As Alberto said, we, we have a sort of uh, regional flavor here, but I think that knowing something about how firms move and, and make them strategies in the territory is, is also helpful. Um, I have two questions, uh, which to be sure might be due to my insufficient level of attention. If so, please apologize me. The first question is related about the, the first paper. Um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you, or you already accounted in your, in your story uh, the possibility that uh, diversification and, and therefore relatedness has got a sort of nonlinear impact on the variables that you consider. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether there could be actually a threshold under which uh, diversifying could be helpful after which instead entails that firms go too ahead from their competences and then it become uh, counter counterproductive, so to say. Uh, this is this question question number one, and and the second question is instead related to paper number two, where, as far as understood, the the, the categories of firms that you have built up, uh, basically consider products that uh, appears for the, for the first time in India and have already been introduced some, somewhere else. Correct. Yeah, yeah, is, not, is that uh, yeah. Is, uh, I'm, I was wondering whether it could be possible to further enrich the picture by considering uh, products that enter for the very first time in the world through India. Yeah, and they are very few. <laughs> that would be first, first, super first mover, so to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so to, to first uh, go to the first question on the diversification and related and check the non-linear impact. Actually, we did. There are a lot of papers, especially like the, uh, the classic SMJ papers that talk about the different shapes of. Uh, so we did check and we didn't find much <laughs> of a non-linear impact. And we did control for the non-linearities by uh, in the regressions. So this is what we did for the and for the second one. Yeah, it's a. Um, um, I think it it is interesting uh, to look at also the the products that are new to the world, but the products that are new to the world are kind of protected by patents. Uh, this is one thing, and the other thing is that the products that are new to the world, uh, there are very few that have been done in India. So uh, already the patents itself are very very few, and. Um, uh, we exactly want to deal with the other side in the sense we much of the innovation in developing countries it's about imitating products and so um, also from the policy perspective this is the this was the interesting part no because one uh, the products that are new to the world are protected by but this are not so that's why I think there should be some kind of incentive structure so this is the one that we wanted to concentrate on. Mm, but overall, also talking about both products and process patterns itself um, is few, and what actually makes the market is fewer. Uh, yeah, I, I suspected that that, that the, the reply would have been this one, but uh, I wanted just to have a confirmation of that. So it's just a question of very few cases of that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 there are very few, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Sandra, for the question. Um, is there any other question uh, ending from the audience? Adriana, you've got your 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 end raised. Is it from before? 
or is it a new question? No, I think I think it, that she forgot. It's from before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, no further questions. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, I I want to thank you, Nandita, for for the interesting presentation. And um, I hope to, we hope to see you soon. Uh, come and see us soon when the restrictions are left, and we will do the same. <laughs> uh, and so, thank thanks everybody for joining the seminar. Um, thanks, Nandita, again. No, thank, thank thanks to all of you for for the wonderful comments, and thanks, Sandro. Thanks, Alberto. <laughs> you're more, you're more than welcome. We we really look forward to having you here in L'Aquila. I mean, it's not that far away from Rome. I mean, now I know, I know, I I I go there often. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. So that, that yeah. would be an, a reason more for coming. Yeah. Uh, some pecorino yeah. is waiting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, definitely. Okay. Next time, uh, okay. okay. I, will, I will let you know. Yeah. And a big hug to your family over the civil, okay? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks again, Alberto and Sandro. It was really great. And thanks for the wonderful comments. And uh, I hope to include them. And uh, yeah, next time in person, let's hope. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank ciao. you. Bye bye. Thank you. Ciao. Bye -bye. Bye. Grazie, Alessandro. Grazie a te, Alberto. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. ciao, ciao.